Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the King of Kings, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Um, I am not trying to stay in this topic, but the Lord seems to just keep speaking to me about these things and keeping me here. So, you know, I found some very interesting things recently and I would like to share them. Uh, but anyways, this, this is looking at kingdom against kingdom, like concerning the last days where, you know, the Lord said nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Well, the nation against nation is the physical wars, but the kingdom against kingdom is the spiritual wars. You know, because we have a kingdom of the world of darkness, and then we have the kingdom of light, the Lord's kingdom. And the two are at odds. Okay, but let's take a look. Um, so the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the world. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Um, I find this interesting because... You know, he said, if his kingdom was of this world, then would his servants fight. That meaning physically. But we're told in uh, 2 Corinthians 10.4, it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Okay, they're not of the world. They're not physical. But mighty through God. Okay, they're spiritual. And then we're told in Ephesians 6.12, um, you know, we don't battle against flesh and blood. You know, people. But against principalities against powers against rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places and these things are spiritual and i just want to point out concerning that we don't battle flesh and blood we have this scripture here in galatians 4 29 says but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit even so it is now so when you look at the scripture, it almost looks like a battle, you know, like a bat, like we're battling against these uh, people, you know, that are born after the flesh, you know, just regular old human beings. But, you know, if you look at Ephesians 2, 2, it says, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So when you look at this, we see the spirit is working in people, you know, the people who have not been born again. They have not been born of God's spirit. Okay, and they walk according to the course or the ways of this world, um, you know, because Satan is the God of this world. And if a person isn't born again, they're under his influence. So, you know, in our battle, in our warfare, we have to realize they are not who we're battling against. Um, and then on the note of the battle, just want to take a look at because you know really when it, you boil it right down keeping yourself unspotted from the world is the warfare because you know like that scripture said the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God and it talks about pulling down strongholds you know uh, imaginations thoughts and then bringing those things into captivity to the truth so you know our walk we have to renew our minds firstly that we can order our behavior correctly but the warfare it is you know mostly in our mind and it is to be unspotted from this world to be you know separate from it and the question we need to ask ourselves you know are we fighting because that's what the life of a christian is it, it is you know contending for the faith once delivered to the saints it is battling it is warfare in the spirit realm Okay, and James 4, 4 tells us, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity or hatred of God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the wor world is the enemy of God. Now this is serious. I don't, I don't think we as Christians take this too seriously in this day in which we're living. And I am going to get into something that shows the difference between the early church and the church age today. Um, and then we have 2 Corinthians 6, 17 through 18. It says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So, you know, plainly, the Lord tells us, come out of the world, be separate. And if we're going to be a friend of the world, or fellowshipping with the world, you know, then we're going to be an enemy of God. You can't, like the word says, you can't serve God mammon. But uh, what I found, I wanted to share what I found. It kind of blew my mind. Uh, but it did 
also confirm, you know, what what I'm seeing in the word concerning coming out of the world. This this really confirmed it for me. But I, I came across an early church writing. Um, I don't know if you're on my Facebook, you might have saw the Two Kingdoms thing I posted, but this really just blew my mind. I mean, literally when I was listening to the the teaching, I like wrote these things down because I, I just had to find out what they were. But it says, these are his words, um, speaking to a Roman. He, this was like an uh, answer back. This is from Tertullian, Apology, chapter 38. It says, but as those in whom all zeal in the pursuit of glory and honor is dead, we have no pressing inducement to take part in public meetings, nor is there aught more entirely foreign to us than the affairs of state. We acknowledge one all-embracing commonwealth, the world. We renounce all your spectacles as strongly as we renounce the matters originating them. We know, which we know were conceived of superstition. When we give up the very things which are the basis of their representations, okay, among us nothing is said, seen, or heard that has anything in common with the madness of the circus, the immodesty of theater, the atrocities of the arena, or the useless exercise of the wrestling ground. Why do you take offense? We differ from you in regard to your pleasures. Now, when I first heard this, I, I mean, of course, I've been familiar with the Roman arena, okay? And this immodesty of theater just immediately spoke to me of TV and movies. But, you know, I didn't, and a circus, I'm like, wow, the madness of the circus. Like, I get, you know, thinking clowns and elephants, whatever. But I had to look into these things. And I just want to share what I found because these are things that the early church renounced, gave up, had nothing in common with. Okay, so, and when we compare the early church to the church of today, you know, I think we're in trouble. Um, but let's take a look at what these things were, because I was very shocked. Okay, so the Roman theater, when I Googled, I just simply Googled Roman theater, okay? And it's interesting to me, this word spectacle is in here, because remember, it said, we renounce all your spectacles, okay? And I was like, I the only thing I could think of is like when a, a parent might tell a child throwing a temper tantrum, you're making a spectacle of yourself, you know, stop that. But anyways, when I looked this up, the Roman theater, I came and found spectacle was in it. So what it said was spectacle was an integral part of life in the Roman world. This pervasive culture of spectacle served both as a vehicle for self-advertisement by the socio-political elite and as a means of reinforcing shared values and institutions of the entire community. Okay, entertainment included mime, orations, which, you know, in order is someone, a speaker, um, music, dance, and different types of plays, including farce, tragedy, and comedy. So when I'm looking at this, I was like, yeah, this Roman theater, like I said, it spoke to me about TV and movies. And it's very interesting to me that spectacle, you know, was a, a part of it and, and it and it served, you know, to self-advertisement, which we know the Lord said in the last days, men will be lovers of their own self, lovers of pleasures, you know, pleasures, the pleasures of this world. So, you know, and reinforcing shared values. I mean, we find the world pushing its values definitely in movies and TV and music and everywhere, okay? And then when I looked up the Roman circus, this one is the one that surprised me the most because I was expecting, like, literally clowns and elephants, okay? But it said it's a, it's a chariot stadium, a rounded or oblong with tiers of seats. It's, it's a, you know, it's used for equestrian, which, of course, is horses, and other sports and games. The Circus Maximus was the largest chariot stadium, holding 150,000 people. A traveling company of performers, as we know a circus today, which was my thought, you know, dates from the late 18th century. So what this guy's talking about is this Roman circus, okay? And it's simply sports, you know, a place where they had competitions. And then... Um, the Roman arena, of course, which most people, you know, are familiar with that. Yeah, uh, the Colosseum, you know, it was built between 70 to 72, and that is A.D. Let me add that in there. And it was under the rule of Vespasian. 
So the atrocities that it spoke of, criminals and prisoners of war were sentenced to death and killed in front of cheering crowds by crucifixion, wild animals, or being burned alive. And to my big surprise, when I was searching this, like I've always known and history knows, Christians were killed there. Everybody knows this. History has always declared it. But when I was looking at Google, it, it, it had been more or less fact-checked, like so many things, and it said, you know, there's no, no evidence that this ever happened to Christians. And things are changing, you know, things are being changed, history's being changed, and that just really blew my mind. Um, but the Roman wrestling ground, okay, this was great. The Olympics held every fourth year. How's that? How's that? So I got to say these words I have here in white, okay, because truth is truth, okay? So we want the things of the world. So make the halftime shows at the Super Bowl, the opening and closing ceremonies of the Olympics and movies, etc., acceptable for us to partake, okay? We don't even realize our error in the church. If our eyes, our ears, and our hearts are always being entertained, by the things of the world, then they are not set upon the Lord at all. Now, this is serious stuff to me. You know, I never, we grow up, we're born in this world and we're raised by parents and we buy traditions. We buy just so much stuff. And, and, and when you look at this, the early Christians had nothing to do with this stuff. And here we are, the church in the last days, trying to tell the world, shape up. Make yourself acceptable for us. We, we want to we wanna partake, okay? But we're not supposed to be partaking. You know, these things are of the world. The world is never going to change because it lies in wickedness. And it's going to lie that way till the Lord comes. And this is why the Lord tells us, come out and be separate, okay? Because we're not to be, like when that scripture said, touch not the unclean, it means do not attach yourself to do not be in intimacy, fellowship. You know, our kingdom is different. First John two fifteen through 17, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. When we take the scripture at face value, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. Come out, be separate. You know, all the things the word says to us. You know, we have to take a look. Where is the church at today? Because I'm seeing a lukewarm Laodicea who says, I'm rich and I have need of nothing. And we just live in our comfort. Here in America, I, I can't speak for the rest of the world, okay? But we need to make some changes in the church. And then I want to talk about which kingdom overcomes, okay? Because we are told in Revelations 13, 7 through 9, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear to hear, let him hear. So this is what the word says, the beast will overcome the saints, but look, okay, look, because we have to let scripture interpret scripture here. Um, it says in Revelations 12, 11, they overcame him, okay, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, they loved not their lives unto death, okay, so if we are dead to the world, we're dead to the flesh, and we're dead to the lures of the enemy through being separate from this world, having renewed minds, and crucifying our flesh. Okay, And we are alive in Christ. It is we who overcome. It is God's kingdom that will overcome. Even though the beast makes war against saints and overcomes them by physical, you know, physical uh, death. Okay, It doesn't matter. We still are the one who overcomes. Okay, John 12, 25, it says, He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal. So look at that again. Add that in. Okay, he that hates his life in this world, 
will keep it unto eternal. So he that loves his life in this world shall lose it. Why? Because you can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God. You can't, you can't do both. You can't serve both. You can't be lukewarm. 2 Timothy 4, or actually this is supposed to be chapter 2 here, uh, verse 4 through 5, it says, No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. No, wait, I'm sorry, let me move that down here. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yeah, he's not crowned, except he strives lawfully. So when you look at this, I mean, our life here as Christians, we are in a war. We are to be battling daily, daily. And we are soldiers, you know, in a kingdom that is not of this world. And so when it talks about striving lawfully, what's he saying? He's saying any man of the wars does not tangle himself with the affairs of this life, of this world. Okay, that's lawful. Why? Because God said... Come out and be separate. If you love the world, you're an enemy of God. That's simple. Okay, we need to grasp these things to the depths of our soul because time is short. Okay, uh, 1 John 5, 3 through 5, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So here we see the key. We must have faith. And if we are born of God, born of his spirit, we will overcome this world. And like the word says, you know, in the last days, it tells us plainly, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Okay, if you're going to come out and be separate, you're going to be persecuted, not just by the world but you're going to be persecuted by lukewarm I guess if you want to call them Christians you can but there's a lot of people out there who have taken the name of the Lord as their own you know call themselves Christians but the Lord does not know them nor do they love him okay but notice all who live godly in Christ Jesus suffer persecution but the world loves its own so you know that's one thing we need to take account of in our own lives are we being persecuted because if we're not, we need to step up our godly. And I know I've said this before in videos, but again, time is short, okay? We pursue the glory and honor of God. That's what we do. Like that Tertullian said, you know, we're dead to pursuing the glory and honor of this world. But we are alive to pursuing the glory and honor of God. You know, the word tells us we seek a city to come. We live for a kingdom that cannot be moved. Ours is a country that is in heavenly that's what the word tells us, okay? This is not our home. We're just passing through. Okay, Revelations eleven fifteen. The seventh angel sounded, and this is what we're waiting for right now today. We're waiting for the coming of the Lord and that last trump to sound. And when it does, it says, There were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Okay, that's what we're waiting for. And then it goes on to tell us in Daniel 7, 27. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven. Now this is talking the earth. Shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. Okay. And what's it tell us in the word? The meek inherit the earth. Okay. Whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall, shall serve and obey him. So this is what we're heading into right now. And we need to be ready. We need to, like the word says, his wife has made herself ready. Time is short. We don't know when our last breath is. If we're playing around the world, we need to repent. We need to repent. Revelation 3.21, Jesus said to him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. And so this is the promise right here. Like Jesus, you know, we, we got to follow him. We got to take up our cross, deny ourselves, and do not be caught up in this world, its pleasures, the cares of this life. Because if we are, that day is going to come upon us unaware. The word declares that very plainly and the word is trustworthy. We can believe it. So as we continue on day to day, kingdom against kingdom, because this battle, this warfare is not going to end until the day the Lord comes. 
But as we go on kingdom against kingdom, let's make sure we're actually in the war. We're actually in the battle. You know, we're actually battling the proper kingdom because we don't want to be find, found fighting against the truth, fighting against the Lord, because that's where the world is found in the end of days. We need to receive the word and walk according to it. And may it be so for God's glory. May he wake up the sleepers that are claiming to be Christians that are just all bound up in this world and its entertainments. You know, the lust of the eyes. Think about, just think about cell phones, you know. Think about cell phones and the poor children who are coming into this world and immediately, you know, being cast upon this, this eye candy, you know. It's just a sad day we're living in. And if we don't wake up and warn the people, so many, so many are going to a place, an eternal place that is horrible. And Jesus made the way so we could be saved and we need to share the gospel with folks. But on that note, we ourselves, we have to come out and be separate. How can we say to the world, oh, you can be free, you know, when, when we're not free. We have to be free from this world. There's a scripture that talks about we have a readiness to avenge all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. You know, we have no right to speak against something that we're partaking of and you know we just need to really step it up in the church the Lord told us how it was going to be in the last days but we don't want to be a part of the apostasy we don't want to be a part of the hypocrisy we don't want to be a part of those sinners in Zion who are going to be afraid when the Lord comes we want to be those who are going to have boldness in that day because as he is so are we in this world Amen.